consider getting in one. And so what we want to take a look at uh, this morning is our scripture is coming from James 2, 1 through 10. James 2, 1 through 10. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this, but so James 2, 1 through 10, and I like to read from here, it says, my brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So I want to talk just a moment about the subject favoritism has no place in the church. So what we see here is that during the time of the early church, there was a huge distinction made between the Jewish and the Gentile believers. Jewish believers had a zeal for the law. You know, they, they, uh, they had what they call both the moral law and the traditions or the ceremonial law. And so they've kind of frowned upon anybody who didn't share that same view. You know, if you didn't, you didn't share the same view, it's like, uh, uh, you know, you, in order to be a part of this fellowship, you need to be able to honor and keep both types of the law if you want to come in here. Okay? But the Gentile Christians, on the other hand, they weren't required to observe all of that ceremonial law and stuff. And, and so they didn't have to do all of those customs that the Jews practiced. So this meant that there were two distinct groups of believers in the Jewish community. Those who observed the ceremonial law and those who were exempt from it. The rub is that the former Jews turned Christians now considered themselves to observe a higher and more complete form of Christianity. See, and, 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 and so then, then what you see within these congregations then, the Christians folks, the Gentile Christians, were not treated equally, especially when it came to wealth. Now, so then James challenged, he challenged this inconsistent practice and he provided an illustration to clearly set forth its meaning. He says that such a practice of exalting the rich and degrading the poor is sinful. Any way you look at it, it's sinful. Then he addresses the root cause. He said, guys, not only is it sinful, it's sinful judgment. You're sitting up here judging folks because when they walk in the door, they don't look like you. They may smell a little different. They may have a little extra dirt on them. And so now you're sitting in judgment if you'd exalted yourselves and other folks and you think you're better than they are. And so how did James do that? Well, he then he contrasted a finely clothed rich man who wears a gold ring with a poverty stricken bearer, beggar. And so the picture he painted for them was was this stark difference between wealth and all of its trappings and poverty and its appearance. See, the rich man was given a seat of honor and prominence in the church. Come on over here. Sit right up here where everybody can see you. Sit up here where everybody can see you. And to the poor man that walked through the door, they said, well, you go back there by Reggie. Stand back there by that stage back there. 
Okay, you sit back there. That's where we need for you to be. And so the, push man, the, the poor man was pushed in the corner and out of sight. He probably didn't smell so good. His clothes were a little bit dirty. But we dare not put him where everybody can see him. Of course, now we want the rich man up here where everybody can see him. So the first thing I want to mention to you is that partiality neglects the image of God in fellow humans. Let me say that again. Partiality neglects the image of God in fellow humans. So, so when we play favorites, we discard the fact that God created all of us in his image. Each of us should receive the same honor and dignity as the rich man. It doesn't matter whether we, we you know, what our, what our income level is or, or where we live or whatever. We ought to get that same respect. You see, it, it, but we get, we get this, this thing, we get caught up in social standing and sometimes we get caught up in church standing. And we'll judge a book by its cover. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what, what I mean. And I've got uh, Jackie and I, when we lived in, in Barstow, and, and uh, we went to buy a new car. And, and we went to the, to the, I remember we went to the Oldsmobile dealership, and we walked in. I'd been painting that day. You know, I'd been painting. I still had my paint clothes on. You know, we're going to buy a car. We walked in, a dude sitting over in the corner reading the paper. Sitting over in the corner reading the paper. And uh, he looked up, and he went back to reading his paper, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, hmm, okay. And somebody else walked in, hey, how y'all doing? And they just kept on going, you know, kept walking. I'm like, okay. And I finally told Jack, I said, it was, a, it was an Oldsmobile dealership right across the street. We went to the Ford dealership first, right? Oldsmobile dealership right across the street. I said, let's go to the Oldsmobile dealership. We got over to the Oldsmobile dealership. dealership. Didn't matter that I had on pay clothes. We walked in the door and said, hey, how you doing? How can we help you today? I'm like, all right, this is what I'm talking about right here. You know, this is what I'm talking about. Don't matter what I look like. You know, I know I smell like paint and stuff, got all splotches all over me and stuff, but it's like, he said, how can we help you? So we came out of there with, Jack came out with a brand new Oldsmobile, you know, and, and so you know me, we was in the brand new Oldsmobile. I drove over to the Ford place and honked the horn. <laughs> uh -huh. Hey. You know, see, you judge a man by what he looks like instead of looking at him for who he is or who she is, right? And so we've allowed societies and, and sometimes our own church traditions, like we say, to shape our thought processes, even when it comes to how we conduct ourselves in church. So if a guest who's less fortunate than we are comes into the church, we should welcome them and let them sit wherever they want to sit. We don't want to push them anywhere else. Uh, so, so I grew up in a time, you know, now I, I grew up in a time where nobody sat on the front row but the deacons. I came from down south, boy, you better not get up on that front row, you know. The only time they put you up on the front row, now they had what they had, but didn't have it so much in my church, but it was a practice down there. They put you on display on the mourner's bench. They had what they called the mourner's bench down there. They put you on display. Boy, you're sinning. Get on up here on the morning bench. mourner's bench. Need to pray for you. You know, got to save your soul. You know, that they put you on display then. You know, we thank God we didn't do that at our church because I think half the church had been up on the morning's bench. But, uh, but, but, but if an unchurched person walks through our door and if an unchurched person sits on this front row, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. If you want to sit with the deacons, I want the deacons to move over. Let them sit down and talk to them. Right? Talk to them. You know, if a man walks in with his hat on, is that going to affect his worship? No. Not at all. Not at all. You know, but, but, but will the guy go to hell because he wore his hat in church today? No, he won't. The problem is we become more concerned sometimes with, with a person, a man pulling his hat off than we are with him putting Jesus on. See, that's the issue that we have. That's the issue that we have. So then let's, let's take a look at the second thing here, which is that partiality makes us a judge over others. In the world, discrimination is a common occurrence, but in the Christian fellowship of the church, there is no room for humiliation or arrogance. We're all Christ's brothers and sisters and heirs to his riches. And so when the type of partiality that, Jesus, that, that, that James describes goes on in the church, how can we not be bothered by it? It ought to disturb us. We're determining someone's value based on the way that they look. We've got preconceived notions about them, just like that man 
who was sitting reading the newspaper when we were trying to buy a new car, right? We got preconceived notions. God doesn't look at our outward appearance. He looks at the condition of the heart. And so when you talk about folks judging you, a story that has always stayed with me, I'll never forget from the time we were, we were small kids, probably seven, eight years old. And, and I remember our dad was the head of the Baptist Training Union. You let us know it as BTU back in those days, growing up in Little Rock, Arkansas, I'm talking back in the 60s. And they were doing some kind of movie at, the, at, the, at, at First Baptist, it was, which was a big white church that was there. And uh, they, they sent out this thing to all the churches, black, white, blue, green, other, don't matter about color, come on. You know, bring your kids, and I forget what the, what the Christian movie was. And so here my dad and about three other chaperones, we got about, about 20 of us young folks with them. And we go down to the church and we wanted to go. We were going in to see the movie and we got stopped at the steps to the church. And the usher at the door said, you're not welcome here. He said, you're not welcome here. You know, uh, this movie is for so and so or whatever. My dad, being the humble man that he was, didn't say anything then. He just gathered us all up. And we went back to the church or whatever. But when he got home, I've never seen my dad cry so hard as he cried that day. And, and, and he, was not, he was not crying because of what the man said to him. But he was crying because the place that was supposed to welcome us the place that was supposed to invite us in, the place that said and had advertised, this is God's house, come on in, had turned us away because of the color of our skin. And my father just, he cried like a baby. And uh, we were, like I said, not because of the injustice done to him, but because of the young children and the impression that that would leave on them. Here I am, 67 years old. And I still remember that like it was yesterday, you know. But, but it was because one man who was the doorkeeper deemed that we were worthless. We weren't worth seeing a movie. Did he really believe that he was doing God's work by turning us away? Now you have to wonder, could we believe when we do stuff like that, are you really, when you think about it, are we really doing God's work. Uh, the same thing happens. It may not be to that extent. But when we show partiality to somebody, we're putting ourselves in God's place by judging the worth of another. So in James time, the people of the church were mostly of humble backgrounds. There were some well to do folks in the church. And as Christians became more rich and powerful, you know, they started to get corrupted by those, some of those rich and powerful ways. Now, don't get me wrong. There were, some, there were some rich Christians already there, but I'm talking about the ones that just slowly came up. You know how folks tend to change when you get, when you get a little something-something? You know, you came up with nothing, and all of a sudden, you, you know, you talking about Jacques Panay. That's my, you know, that's my French tailor. I'm going to Jacques Panay and stuff. Don't even know how to pronounce it. It's J.C. Penny. It's not Jacques Panay. Okay? So... Uh, but, you know, we, we tend to do that. So Jesus taught in Luke 6 and 20 that the kingdom of heaven was especially designed for the poor. But those to who James wrote were doing just the opposite. They were denigrating the poor and then exalting the rich folks. Does that, does that make sense? See, that's what was going on. And we have a tendency to do that when we play favoritism in God's church. Let's look at number three. Number three says favoritism is created by assumptions based on external appearance. So in verse five of that scripture, James says to hearken or give attention. Uh, he says, hey, listen up. The poor were not chosen because of their financial condition. Uh, you know, any more than the rich were rejected because of their wealth. He said everybody has the same invitation to come to Christ and everybody's called the same way. The issue is the gospel means um, 
that the gospel means or is, is God's means of calling folks. You know, we, we, unless we're called, how can we know, right? And so in uh, 2 Thess Thessalonians 2 and 14, it says, he called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Still, the poor often experience a special sense of needing God. For some reason, you know, it seems like when you're poor, God just gets a little bit closer. I don't know if that ex exacerbates your circumstances. You know, if, if I don't have any money, you know, it makes life just a little bit harder. You know, if I don't have a job, it makes life a little bit harder. If I don't have a roof over my head and living in my car, yes, it makes life just a little bit harder. And, and, and so the poor often experience a special sense of needing God, while the rich are often complacent and self-dependent. We've seen it. You know, the more I got, it's like, look what I did. Look what I did. So James said the church folks had elevated the rich and despised the poor. The irony is that the rich folks are the ones who oppressed them. That's the ones who was dogging them out, taking them to court, sending them to jail. But yet you bring the one that dogged you out, sent you to jail, and you put them right up here in front, let everybody see. Okay? And then the rich, men's, rich men are the ones who blasphemed by name those who were called Christians. You know, they blasphemed them. They, you know, they, 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 they talked about them. But yet you want to put them on display. Why? Let's go to number four and we'll answer that question. Number four says favoritism focuses on what we can receive rather than what we can give. So some believe that maybe they, 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 that they paid this special attention to the rich man because the rich man had deep pockets. Rich man might be able to give us a little more in the offering plate. Rich man might be able to do some things that we couldn't do otherwise. And so, but you see there again, you know, you talk about the appearances fooling you if you're poor. There's some rich folks who will fool you, too. All right. One more story. Jack and I had a whole lot of things happen to us when we were in Barstow. You know, one more story. We went, we went to buy some furniture. Went, went to the furniture store this time. And, of course, this time I wasn't looking like paint. You know, I was, I was kind of like normal. But went to the furniture store. And, again, the guy looked at us, Pat. The guy looked at us. Oh, I'll let so-and-so handle you. Brand new kid, first day on the job. Then there was this older Caucasian lady that came in behind us, had rings on her finger big as my head. This dude broke his neck getting up. Run up, yes, ma'am, may we help you? That woman ran that man around that store for about two and a half hours. Jack and I were in there. We were in this kid. It was his first day. We bought about four to $5,000 worth of stuff that day for this kid on his first day. The woman who ran that man around or whatever left the store and said, see ya, didn't buy nothing. But we were, we were dying laughing. And this little kid was like, thank you, oh thank you, this is my first day, I'm at the top of the sales heap. And said, all right. See, God's got a sense of humor. You know, see, see, see you know, uh, 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 but, but folks will fool you. Just cause they look rich don't mean they ain't cheap. All right, that's probably how they got rich. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so but, but, but that's not unlike the church today. Sometimes churches focus on the rich in hopes of getting financial gain sometimes. sometimes. And I'm not saying that, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, that, you know, but there are some that do that. All right? And this, that's contrary to God's grace. God's grace says a gift is freely given with nothing expected in return. That's what grace is. A gift that's freely given with nothing that's expected in return. So when we do that, when we become partial, when we make a difference in folks, then we're not following God's plan for what we ought to be doing. So then when we look at verses 8 and 10, and I want to kind of look at these verses 8 through 10, I want to read it says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, then you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin. And are convicted by the law as lawbreakers for whatever for whoever keeps the law, the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty at breaking all of it. So what James says is you try to keep part of the law. You excuse this part over here. You, know, you excuse it. You make excuses for this part over here. You want to keep part of it. 
But then this part over here, you said, no, you got to do this and you got to do that. And so and James is saying, hey, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. If you didn't keep this part, then it's all no good. That's what he's saying. It's all no good. So he says, you got to keep the whole entire law and only keep part of it means that you haven't kept any of it. And so then that leads us to number five. Partiality and favoritism are inconsistent with love. Those in the church who gave respect to the rich over the poor were still guilty of sinning. James emphasized that they could not pick and choose which laws to keep while refusing to keep others. So it boils down to two things for the church then and for the church now. Those two things are love God and love people. Love God and love your brother man or love your sister. In Christ, that is. All right. So our horizontal relationship with one another is just as important as our vertical relationship. Think about that. Our horizontal relationship to God is just as important as our virtue, as our vertical relationship to our fellow man. And so the axis that is formed by our relationship to God and the one that is formed by our relationship with our fellow human human beings give us that picture of the cross. Right. That's that axis, that picture of the cross. We're reminded of the immeasurable, immeasurable act of God, of the love God showed for us when he sent Jesus to die on the cross. When we make a difference in one another, we fail to understand the complete love that God had for each and every one of us. God loves us all equally with no strings attached. He didn't say, I love this one more than I love that one, so I'll give this one special treatment. Romans 3 and 10 reminds us that there is no one who is righteous, not even one. We were all placed on equal ground. Hear me. We were all placed on equal ground at the foot of the cross. Everybody's on equal ground. One songwriter wrote at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. He said, it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. Then somebody else said, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me because one day when I was lost, he died on the cross. I know it was the blood for me. And then another one said, love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me see that same love requires that we live each lift each other up in prayer you see that we treat one another with love and that we respect one another particularly in God's house there's no room for favorites in here God builds his kingdom with people from every walk of life who loved him and who loves to keep his word. But he requires not only do we love him, but we got to love others. If we don't love others, we're not going to make it. That's what it's all about. You know, what did Jesus say? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind and all thy strength. And he said, the second is like the first, love thy neighbor as thyself. So if we don't love our neighbor, we can't love God and say and, and not love our neighbor. Because if that's the case, we don't love God. We can't keep part of it and excuse the other part. We got to keep it all. Does that make sense? And so it's with that same type of love then that we're required, we are required to treat one another with respect, to love one another regardless of our station, and to be able to support one another whenever it's needed. Because that's what God has done for us. I'd like to offer the invitation at this particular time. And what I mean by that is there may be someone who doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I, I invite you to come forth and know this man 
know this man who is Lord and King of our lives. One who no matter what the situation as, as, as Reverend Pat talked about this morning, we just, no matter what our situation, he's got us. God's got me. It may not seem like it sometimes, but I know he's got me because my faith tells me that he is always with me. Even though in my humanity, I think that I'm standing all alone. That's when he's carrying me. I'm not alone. And in those quiet moments, if I just seek him and listen for his voice, he will comfort me. He will quiet me. He will strengthen me when times get tough. And so I just say to you, if you want to know that Savior, I invite you to come today. Do we have anyone? Is there anyone? You may just be passing through. You may just be visiting today. Maybe you just happen to stumble across this little place called Second Baptist Lake Forest. I invite you, if you are, if you need a church home, I invite you to come here. We're small, as our friend said, boy, y'all small, but you're mighty. You're powerful in here. The Lord is in this place. And so we invite you to spend time here to become a part of this church family. We have maybe someone who just doesn't come like the church like you used to, but you say, I want to come back. And God, I, I'm just kind of ashamed. But don't be ashamed because the Lord will allow us all. He's covered all of those sins. Is there anyone in that category? If not, then we have done what the Lord has commanded. Let's sing that. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Oh, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. When nothing else could help. Love lifted. Before we go, just want to be remind you that, that uh, Deacon Coleman said we need money for the fishing trip today. Norm is sitting out there and he's, he's, he's got his hand out. I see him sitting by the door right now with his hand out saying you got to pay to get out. So, uh, but if you have any monies, we want to be sure that we do that. Don't forget the CPR training next week. Um, Dr. Grace, like we said last week, her husband is still here because she administered CPR. So. All right, if there, did I forget anything, Grace? Oh, Grace, Lord have mercy, Gail. If there's, uh, if there's nothing else, then Rep. Pat, did I forget anything? You got anything? You and Sister Cheryl, no, we're good. All right, let's, let's stand then and we'll be dismissed.